Hi everybody, I'm Theron and I am an alcoholic and I'm currently serving as the bid liaison for the NAAAW so if anybody out there is thinking about hosting a workshop come see me because I can help you through the process. Uh, I'm also on the uh, Area 58 Archives Committee. Hi James, there's my committee chair back there. They let me come in sometimes and uh, copy stuff, uh, digitize stuff and, uh, and they have donuts. So that's, that's my main incentive. Uh, this is about digital archives. I got into digital archives uh, kind of accidentally. I had uh, been to the first couple archives workshops, gotten conservation training from Bob W., who was kind of like the main feature of the first several workshops. And I, when I moved to Michigan, I thought, man, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to join in with the, and, and do all this conservation stuff. I've never been an archivist, but I've done the conservation. I think, you know, I can contribute that way. I get up to Area 32 in Michigan, and it turns out they don't have an archives. Uh, they had a collector who was a real nice guy, and he would bring his stuff to the area meetings and show it. But he was very clear that it was his stuff. It was his collection. Now, over the years, he had saved all the area minutes that had been mailed out. You know, they'd mail them out to anybody that wanted to sign up on a mailing list. So he had saved them all. Nobody else had. So the only record we had of the area, the only area history of anything that we had, was what he had in his personal collection. So I got up there and found out about this, and I said, well, there's just nothing for me to do. I don't know. After a few years, uh, I, one of the past delegates and the delegate and a few other people said, you know, we really ought to like, start a real archives committee and somehow get our own history under our own uh, ownership. So they asked me to chair it. And I went to the collector, and as I said, he was a real nice guy, very cooperative, and I said, do you mind if we scan this stuff? And he said, oh, no, go ahead. He said, just, you know, take a box or two at a time and bring it back when you're done with it. So we did that. And we scanned and scanned and scanned. And there was, uh, I think it started in 1956. So I had almost 60 years worth of stuff to scan. Uh, and that's how I got into digital archives, was kind of back uh, backwards. <laughs> Not going to use bad language. Um, and so uh, having started in it, I thought, well, I'd better look up some information. So this is a distillation of my experience and what I found from reading about it and uh, some cautionary notes. The title of this was Why and Why Not? Um, you'll see. First thing is, you know, we've talked in various workshops about goal statements, scopes, that kind of thing. To be organized and to know what we're actually trying to do, it's nice to have a goal. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, pardon my French, uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So in order to get there, if we're going to start uh, uh, digitizing, we need to know what is it we're going to do, what is it we're going to uh, try to accomplish with this? Are we preserving our paper this way? Are we preserving photos and audio? Uh, do we want to provide remote access? Um, there's only so much you can put on the internet. And do we want to scan things so that we can reuse them in displays? For example, um, you know, once you've got a, a photo scanned, then you can print it onto posters. Just one example. Hmm? Depending, on the Depending on the DPI. Um, so you can get into digital. How many people here have some kind of digital implementation in their archives? Okay, good. A whole bunch of geeky people out here. All right. Um, you know, you can get into it a little bit or a lot or all the way. Um, you can index, uh, your, you can uh, uh, put your index, your accession records, into a digital format, and Bob talked about some databases for that. Probably the simplest example would be to just put them in a spreadsheet, and that way you can sort them. So if you, uh, if you designate uh, what the subject is and when you received it, it makes it easier to find stuff. Somebody comes in and says, I'm looking for uh, Bob M's 
the delegate record from 1987, whenever it was. And you can sort for your uh, delegate papers, 1987, yeah, there it is, and find out. Um, you can keep born digital stuff. Tammy talked about born digital. It's great to work with because it's already there. You don't have to scan it. Some examples were after I scanned all these minutes for Area 32, then I, it, it occurred to me they're generating more of these and the secretary's generating them in a digital format, probably a Word document. I could just ask the secretary to send those to me. Then I wouldn't have to scan the printed documents anymore. And the secretary said, yeah, okay, yeah, sure you want them. So that helped. And then the newsletter. Hey, I don't have to scan newsletters. They've got newsletter records going back some years in already in uh, Word documents. So it takes me a while to figure things out. The obvious comes slowly. But that was very helpful. You can scan all your paper documents in Area 58. We're in the process of doing that because paper, although we, we know a lot about paper, we know how to handle it, uh, if you only have one copy of something, it's subject to what were the enemies of paper, fire, water, bugs, you know, all kinds of things. If you scan it, then you've got a backup copy. In some cases, not as nice as having the original letter, but it's the information that we're really interested in, right? So some things to consider before you jump into this. Um, does this support our primary purpose? When I was working with Gail, uh, I would come in with all these great ideas of, hey, let's do this. And she'd say, uh, does that support our primary purpose? Mm, not sure. But it's a really cool thing to do. So bring it back to the traditions. Um, is it supported by the group conscience? Good reason to have a committee. Is it aligned to your mission statement? Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to any of these things that we're going to digitize or store digitally. And we got to consider the expense, the, the time and effort, the technological capabilities. Do we have other alternatives? Um, for example, for paper documents, you could just photocopy them. Now you got a second copy. And is, what's the expense? What's, it's gonna, what's it going to cost? Does the area support it? Um, is it justified? So what all are we going to digitize? Um, if we have existing collections that we've already got them boxed up, numbered, uh, deacidified, whatever we've done to them, are we going to dredge those out and then scan or do something with them? Um, we talked about born digital. The, a digital finding aid, I think, personally, is a good idea because they're easy to use. Uh, probably the, the old classic way of, of doing a finding aid is a ledger book, right? And you got your accession number and a description, but you can't sort that, and, it's, and you can't search it. So a digital finding aid, whether it's in a database, which is great if you've got database capabilities, or just a simple spreadsheet uh, is very helpful. You're going to put your, your finding aid online. Um, if you make sure that you don't have last names in it, you could probably make the finding aid accessible if you think anybody's going to want to search for their group history or um, when their sponsor went to the, the, went to the GSO uh, General Service Conference. Um, and can you OCR, optical character recognition, scan documents? I found that that, you know, I, when I first got into scanning the minutes, I thought, man, we'll just OCR all this stuff and all the, all the content will be searchable. And the OCR program really did not like them. They were old photocopies, you know, a little blurry. The type was eh, kind of odd. It just wouldn't read them. I went to the Ohio State Historical Society one time and saw they were doing a big scanning project. They had a whole bunch of grad students that were going through the OCR files and making the corrections. Uh, if you have a whole bunch of grad students, you might want to give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> 
So some of the advantages of digital, it doesn't take a whole lot of shelf space, right? I would go into Area 32 and I'd say, here's your archives. <laughs> you can fit everything on the thumb drive. Uh, it's easy to make multiple copies. Back up, back up, back up. Bob was talking about that, and I'll hit on that again, because I don't think you can talk too much about backups. It's easy to share things, and uh, useful in making displays, posters, or whatever you're going to, or uh, website displays. What do you need for resources? Well, you need a computer with scanning software. You need both a sheet feed scanner for documents, something that's fast, and I found the place I worked had a, a high-speed photocopier that would also, it was digital, it would also output a digital file, it would put out a PDF file, and so I'd just stay late at work, look around, well, nobody's watching. I told my boss, he said, yeah, okay, just don't let it get in the way of anything, and uh, I'd dump a, a whole bunch of, a whole stack of stuff into the sheet feeder, and it goes zip, 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 zip and scan both sides, and that was very helpful. You need a flatbed scanner for things that you don't want a sheet feed. You don't want a sheet feed like an old photograph, because what happens with, with sheet feed scanners? Once in a while, they decide to chew things up. Um, you need backup storage media, a secure storage location. Bob mentioned off-site backups. Really essential. Where are you going to put it? Uh, my personal backups, I take one periodically every few months, I take a um, full backup and take it to the bank to the safe deposit box. And I've got two of those uh, hard drives that I rotate, and I'll take one back to home and back up on that and then take one into the bank. And you need, you need one of these. <laughs> For some implementations, I was talking to one guy who said, well, you know, we've got... Uh, this uh, software that runs on a server, and we've got the server loaded on a computer in our uh, in our archives, and uh, you know you've got the LAMP stack, the Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP all running this uh, on the server. Um, an Excel database is a lot easier to do. An Excel spreadsheet is a lot easier to do, and and you can probably do that yourself. So it's, what have you got in terms of volunteers, and what are you likely to be able to keep in terms of volunteers? In Area 32, we did not have anybody like this, and we weren't likely to get anybody like this, so we had to be sure and keep it real simple. Anonymity. Um, if we put this stuff out into the public, obviously that's an issue. Uh, copyright, somebody talked about that in, in uh, some of the basic information about, oh, it was Gail with ethics. Um, that's a good thing to record in the finding aid, is what's the, anon uh, the uh, anonymity and copyright status. The security of your hardware, somebody mentioned about, you know, laptops can walk away. Uh, plan on crashes, that's why we do backups. I got to speed through this. Where I got too many slides. Um, this I finally bought a sheet feed scanner, and this little Hummer just w zip them through two sides at a time. This was a Fujitsu Snap Scan. Not making a plug, but this worked really great for me because it would fold up, and then it just uh, become like the size of a bread box. Um, very handy thing. It was color two sided, fast. And uh, I already had a flatbed scanner at home as part of my uh, all-in-one printer, scanner, fax. Anybody use fax anymore? Uh, I don't know why they even bother with that. So oftentimes, you buy a scanner, it'll be uh, bundled with Adobe Acrobat. Adobe Acrobat does character re optical character recognition, but like I said, it depends a lot on what you feed into it. If you get born digital files, then they are searchable, and you can keyword search those files. Great. Probably the scan stuff, probably not. Software for splitting and merging PDFs is helpful, um, and you can do that with Adobe Acrobat. If you don't pop for Acrobat, which is pretty expensive, you have to buy it yourself, 
you can find some of that much more reasonably priced uh, by do searching on the web. Um, Bob talked about photo editors. I've, I've got my own preferences, but uh, I'm not going to go into software in this. And uh, open source software generally is free and available for download. You can get open source uh, word processors, spreadsheets, photo editors, Audacity, the, the uh, audio editors, uh, open source and free. But they usually require a little more work and a little more patience than proprietary software. What I found out was I, I fired up my scanner, and the first thing it asked is, OK, what resolution do you want? I don't know. You know, what does that even mean? So I looked up on the web, and I found from testing, too, that 300 DPI works pretty well for text. Um, if they were black and white documents, I could make a much smaller file size by setting the scanner software to scan just black and white. Because if I scan in color, it records a lot more information. But the image isn't actually any different because it's still black and white source. So. I set them for black and white, and I could get a lot more uh, images on a disk. 600 DPI color for photos, or you know, you want to do color if for event flyers and things like that, where that's important. Then I would save everything in PDF A. P the A is for archive. And the difference is subtle between regular PDF and PDF A, but PDF-A is uh, an international standard, and it's considered to be more long-term compatible. And it does not embed some things in it that uh, regular PDF does. Your scanning software will probably allow you to set that. Uh, born digital, you can generally export to PDF. The, the software that creates it, uh, you know, if it's Microsoft Word or whatever, uh, has an export selection on the file menu. You can export to PDF. If not, and I get to, I'm also a webmaster, and I get this all the time. People send me things. Say, Could you post this on the web? You know, and it might be an event flyer in JPEG or whatever. Um, there's a website called Zamzar.com, and there's other websites too. This just happens to be the one I use. Z a m z a r.com that will convert pretty much anything into a PDF. And it will also convert uh, if you find you have some old file formats in uh, Lotus or, you know, you remember Lotus? Yeah, that's a great program. But um, the file formats don't open in anything. But Zamzar will convert it. And you just upload it to their site. They send you a, a link to download the converted file, and it's free. PDF, as I said, is considered to be a long-term valid format. Um, pretty much everybody's got PDF readers on their computers so they can open the stuff. It was invented by Adobe. They turned it over to the International Standards Organization, so it's no longer proprietary. Editing PDF. Now, if you don't have Acrobat, um, you can use an image format, there's basically two kinds of PDFs, right? There's one where it scanned your document, but it doesn't know that it's text. It basically just took a picture of the whole thing. So that's an image format PDF. And then the other kind is where you've converted it from Word, and it knows the in the PDF, it knows that that's text, and those are words. And uh, with Acrobat, you can go in and edit that. If you don't have Acrobat, though, there's other ways to do it. In the graphics type, you can use an image editor. Some of them will open PDFs as an image. And you can get in if you need to. Say you want to put something up on a poster, but you want to remove last names. Or you want to pixelate somebody's face out, something like that. You do this on a copy. You don't do it on the original, right? But you can open it in um, the graphics. I forget what GIMP stands for. That's a, an open source one. Paint, Photoshop, open up in a, in a graphics program, and then you can tinker with it. For text type PDFs, 
You can open them in Acrobat Pro. You can also open them in LibreOffice or OpenOffice, uh, which is an open source free uh, software. It's, a, it's an Office suite, much like Microsoft Office. It comes with a drawing program. The, the word processing program will not open PDF, but the drawing program will, and it'll have little blocks where all the text parts are, because it, it recognizes that they're text, and you can, the, each word will be in a separate block, and you can go in there, double click on it, and erase parts. Now, if you try and do more than that with draw, it gets to be really painful because the formatting goes really screwy. But you can go in and just change a word or take out part of a last name and put a period in instead. That's Crater Lake. Um, <laughs> boy, I don't know what I did. That's what it did. It decided to. Just decided. Just decided to quit on me. Okay, file formats. This is something I had to find out. Gail talked about, do you have enough pixels to blow something up? You ever seen things on the web that look like this? Not enough pixels. Um, part of the reason that this happens is when things are stored in JPEG format, they're compressed. Now, JPEG's real popular. It's what you see on the web mostly. But it compresses them. And every time you open it up and you do something to it and then resave it, it recompresses it. So it keeps degrading the image over and over and over again. There are what they call lossless kinds of compression, and there's also non-compressing. TIFF does not compress. It gives you huge files, but they're very nice. Um, P PNG does a compression that does not result in loss of data. It gives you much bigger files than JPEG does, but not nearly as huge as TIFF. Now for audio formats, same thing. There are lossless formats and there are lossy formats. MP3 compresses, loses data. That's why audio files don't like MP3s. They turn up their nose at them. It's just junk. Lossless ones, WAV, much bigger files. Um, there's a couple other formats. Uh, FLAC is the one that's popular with audio files. If they're going to rip uh, a classical music CD, they'll rip it to FLAC. Just a suggestion. When you name files, it took me a while to figure this out, so I thought I'd pass along. When you name files, if you're consistent with it, and you use the ISO date format, which is year, month, day, then in your file manager, they automatically sort themselves into chronological order. Instead of area minutes, September 1995, then it would sort itself so all the Septembers were together. And that's generally not as useful. So what do you store these things on? Well, you got internal hard drives. Um, Backblaze is a commercial backups, online backup service, and they have zillions of hard drives. So they do a study of what, which ones last the longest. And uh, you can see it, it varies a lot from brand to brand, and that changes from year to year. So I don't know that I'd put too much emphasis on which brand, because next year it may be a different brand is best. but. They said most failures occur early, and the meantime, overall, all of their, their collection, all the different brands of hard drives, the meantime between failure was 2.88% uh, annual failure rate. So they figure, on average, 2.8% um, of their drives are going to fail every year. 
makes me a little squeamish. I don't have as many drives as they do, but uh, USB sticks, um, convenient, easy to lose. Um, they've gotten bigger, but uh, for the price, it's still cheaper to put stuff onto a hard drive. CD-ROMs. Remember when you used to be able to back up your computer onto floppy disks? <laughs> yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. And, and we don't really know. You, uh, you'll read in various places what the life expectancy is for these things. We don't really know for sure. And it depends, too, if it, if it was a commercially produced CD-ROM or if it was one that you burned yourself on your own computer. Because they are physically different. Anybody got any of these? Yeah, do you have the drives to, to run them on? Yeah, but you're transferring them. Yeah. So it's good to have a written plan for upgrading your media because sooner or later, the media that we're using now that we think is the current latest thing, sooner or later is going to be like this. And if you have a written plan to at least evaluate, say every couple of years, every five years, whatever, look at your collection and look through and see what do we have that's becoming obsolete and is going to need to be copied. Backups. I promised you. Three, two, one backup rule. Three copies of anything you care about. I am paranoid about backups. And on my home computer, which isn't, you know, it's not as important as the archives or anything, but I got family photos and stuff. I do one copy in, into a cloud backup account. I do one copy into an external hard drive that I take and put into, into the safe deposit box. And then I've got an, a, an, another hard drive sitting right next to the computer. Also, I have a fourth one, and, I, and this is kind of nice. I don't know if it really qualifies as a backup, but I have Dropbox, okay, online storage. There's an application you can install on your computer that mirrors your online account. So I have my documents folder, my photos photo folder, everything in my Dropbox folder on my own hard drive. When I put those things into that, then it automatically mirrors them to the, the web folder online. So it's continually mirroring and it doesn't take up a whole lot of, uh, it doesn't slow the computer down significantly. But uh, when I make a change to anything, within a couple of minutes it's mirrored to the uh, online storage. What's not a backup? Backing up your laptop to some storage media you've got plugged into your laptop? No, because if your laptop gets smoked, it's all gone. Backing up to a hard drive sitting right next to your computer? Not really. If your house burns down, you're toast. Backing up your Google Drive to another Google Drive? Mm, Google's probably not going out of business this week, but that's just kind of shaky. Backing up your documents by copying them to another folder? No, not really. Now we talked about updating uh, your storage media. File formats go out of date too. Um, anybody have any doc files that uh, the, the current version of Word doesn't like to read? Or Excel, old Excel files that the current version of Excel doesn't like to read? Uh, go on Zamzar, it'll convert them. But you want to periodically do the same thing. We have a written plan, periodically look through and see what are old formats that are becoming obsolete and copy them over into the new formats. Proprietary formats have more of a tendency to, to expire. So, you know, Microsoft Doc, they went to DocX. Okay, and those old ones become a problem. Um, the PDF, as I said, is an international spec now, so it's less likely to expire, but still 
as part of your ongoing plan, review that periodically. Um, other long-term formats, these are things that are not proprietary. Uh, text, TIFFs, PNGs, uh, rich text format. This is the open document uh, format for text documents. ODT. I thought it was one day at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talked a little bit about using a, a spreadsheet. That's probably the simplest way to do a digital catalog. Uh, Bob talked a lot about um, uh, databases and that sort of thing. There's a bunch of different ones available. If you do a Google search, you'll turn up a lot of alternatives. Best thing is to talk to somebody who's using one because there's a lot of confusing data out there and everybody touts like ours is the best, of course. Problem with databases is they're more tech intensive and you need that guy with the big glasses. What kind of metadata do you want to include? Metadata, of course, is information about your holding. You got an accession number, right? Um, the date you received it, what collection it's part of. Um, you know, you have collections within your holdings, like here's a collection for Bob M's delegate papers. Here's a collection for area minutes. So what the collection is, that makes them so it's more easy to sort and find stuff. The author, title, where it came from, uh, a description, the date created, copyright information. Do we own a copyright? Probably not. We usually don't on most things. The condition, does it need um, conservation? Does it need uh, some kind of work done to it? and uh, where it's stored. And there's probably some other, you can probably th think of some other items too. Whatever's gonna be useful to you in the future. Um, the Dublin Core uh, metadata standard suggests, oh, I think there's about 18 or 20 columns that you can put into your, your spreadsheet. Uh, and if you, I, don't have the website for it here, but the, uh, just search on Dublin Core Metadata. There's a whole project, professional archivists decided on this stuff. They don't include things that may be useful to us, like anonymity. Some technical resources uh, that I found really helpful because they're talking about digital standards and how to digitize stuff, the National Archives. Um, they also have a nice section on how to, uh, how to preserve your home uh, photos and uh, family histories and that kind of thing. That they've, of course, they're professional archivists and they get into uh, really intensive weeds of professional archives. But for the, the family stuff, they dumb it down to where I can understand it. Digital preservation from the Library of Congress. Um, Northeast Document Center has is, is, is got a whole bunch of papers. They've got a bunch of white papers on all kinds of different aspects of archives and conservation. And um, I think Bob mentioned the State Historical Society. When I moved to Michigan, and I started getting active there finally in, in archives. I joined the State Historical Society and the State Archives Association. Turned out they were like brother and sister, um, but they had workshops and go for half a day for you know, like 20 bucks and they would, they would have somebody who was an expert come in and talk to you about how to create displays, how to digitize collections, uh, just all kinds of useful things at a at a low level that was useful to me because they have in the in the state historical society they not only have people from uh, you know big archives big historical association but they have like the the county historical society where they've got a house uh, on the edge of town and uh, a few few items there from pioneer days and like one paid staff. Um, so they've got people that are kind of in a similar position to us where 
uh, they're not professional archivists and they're looking for help. Great bunch of people. So, got a little bit of time left. I realize lunch is looming before us, but uh, we got time for some questions. Anybody? How can we get a copy of your presentation? Uh, this presentation, along with a bunch of other ones, will be on the uh, uh, NAAAW website in the wiki section. It's maybe not the most obvious place to look for it. Yeah. But we have a bunch of presentations from past archives workshops. And, and if you click on the la it's the last button on the right hand side and go into the wiki, you'll find information for uh, bid committees, information on past workshops. Um, there's a lot of stuff we've been posting there. I hope to get it a little easier to find shortly, but uh, this presentation and anybody else that I can con them into uh, contributing their, their presentations will be up there. It's not up there now, but shortly. Okay. Hi. How do you spell wiki? And secondly, earlier you were talking about three letters like O-R-G, O-C-R. What does that mean? What are they? Wiki is W-I-K-I. And what it is, it's a, uh, I don't know if it's a Maori word or it's, a, it, what it means is quick. And it's in, wikis are uh, like Wikipedia, are intended to be quick places to post information. Okay, OCR is, stands for optical character recognition. And what it, end, what it aims to do is when you scan a document, the OCR program will try to pick out the letter shapes and turn it into words so it can be recorded as text instead of just a picture of the document. Um, if, it's, if it's a crisp, clean copy, they can work okay. If it's um, you know a 30-year-old photocopy that's been copied a number of times and it's a little blurry and crooked, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> I have a question about um, Born Digital. Let's say we've got something that's in WordPerfect and we need to store that. Um, we've already got it, now do we then convert it to anything that'll read it and store it as a PDF? And do we keep the original? Well, let's choose one that's up to date. You've got something in Word at the moment. Do you just store that? or do you convert it to a PDF and store both? When Word updates, do you keep the original and put the updated Word, Word version in there and the PDF? I'm a little confused about what I need to store. Yeah, the question is, do you save the original file format if you're going to convert it into PDF? Um, for your Word Perfects, that's a good thing that you can run through Zamzar and it'll convert it into something more currently readable. I have not been saving the original Word documents after I've converted them to PDF. That may give some archivists fits because uh, we no longer have the original born digital document. But um, it's up to you and your archives committee and your group conscience. newspaper articles and things like that that uh, we want to preserve digitally. Um, the only thing that we've come up so far, and we haven't gone very far with this, is just take a picture with our iPhone, but does that uh, end up in JPEG? It does. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it probably ends up in JPEG. Um, you can convert JPEG, if you, if you do it right away and convert JPEG into a lossless format, 
before you've opened it and, did, and edited it and opened it and edited it, uh, you'll preserve it in as close to its current form as you can. So you convert that JPEG into a TIFF or a PNG um, right away, then you, you don't run into the problems that JPEG can cause over time. Uh, Zamzar, you can do it online. If you have a whole bunch of them, uh, I, I think Irfanview will uh, convert. Yeah. And uh, scanning, uh, scanning or photocopying newspaper articles is a great way to preserve them because it's generally not worth doing uh, conservation, doing deacidification on a bunch of newspaper articles, but that's the worst paper. It's really crappy, acidic paper. Yeah, Mary Kay Frazier, Area 67 Archive Chair. Just to comment on that, um, my Nikon takes TIFFs, and so I can just photo it in TIFF and then download that. Yeah, good point. A, a higher-end camera... Um, you can choose the file format. Uh, Lila, Area 50 Archives. One of the things I've found is that to be able to be as active as we need to be as archivists, to be able to get the stuff that we really need, I've been handed a lot of things and told you can't take it anywhere, and of course I don't carry a scanner with me. One of the things that I learned really fast that was not going to come up in my head is the fact that with these... Um, with the documentation, people have um, newspaper articles and a lot of things that they're willing to hold out in front of me. And if I use my camera and I take a picture of it, it's a fine thing. But the point is to never, never, never transfer it with these little programs that are going to smunch it down and make it smaller to transfer. If you go directly from your camera and s with that highest resolution possible and you transfer it directly to an email so that you don't lose any of the clarity in that photograph, those are able to be opened up in different types of software and be able to be read as a OCR to, to be able to actually read the thing afterwards because otherwise you just get something that when it tries to open it, it can't recognize it. And when I started telling the people in the field that they want to send me something, yeah, shoot it with a camera and send it to me, but send it to my email. Don't text that over to me because when they text it to me, it becomes way smaller and I can't use an OCR to be able to read it and actually get the text off of it. Yeah, another caution is if you upload photos to Google Drive or Google Photos, it compresses them. Gene Akron, uh, Area Assistant Archivist. Uh, we have an old scanner, a uh, high-resolution scanner, and uh, my IT people tell me that it was uh, the company, I, I can't think of the name right, MyTech or MinTech or something like that, but the company was bought by a Chinese company, and there's no available update software. This Zantac that you're talking about, do you think I could? I do have the disk for this, you know, the, and it was in XP. That's how old it is. <laughs> if I sent, if I put that in the Zanzar, will I be able to get, be able to use this scanner? Or? Probably not. Probably not because it's not going to update software. All it does is change one format to another format. And, you know, high, high resolution scanners are great. And if you're going to scan photos with really high resolution and then blow them up into posters. But otherwise, um, you wind up with enormous files that maybe don't get you any further than doing something at a you know 600 dpi i've seen scanners with uh, much higher than that but is it really useful to you hi um does dropbox compress photos no and qr codes do you have any have, have you been using qr codes to label boxes to anything like that it, I oh okay i was just wondering I no i haven't been using qr codes but you certainly could I'm just curious to know if uh, there's an OCR software that can convert handwriting. <laughs> I haven't found any. Um, maybe with improvements in artificial intelligence yeah. someday. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, 
when you think about it, uh, there's a lot of people whose handwriting we can't read, um, right? Uh, Mitch Alcoholic, I'm the Area 9 Archivist. So for anything other than machine uh, prepared text, the only way to really do that is a two-person manual input. So you have two people typing, they read the text, and you compare between it. So a lot of this is manual input after a while. And for the older texts, you may that may be your only solution to get a clean copy, is to do an OCR, try that first, and if not, then just sit down and retype the, the entire piece. For those people who are not familiar with OCR, what it'll do is it, it'll take a stab at turning it into words, and then you can go back in and correct things where it's wrong or where it wasn't able to read stuff, and it'll put in some all weird character symbols and stuff if it doesn't recognize a letter. But that gets really tedious real fast, and if you've got a whole box full of documents, it's just not practical. One of the things that hasn't been talked about here is one of the main things that have been used in the medical industry for dozens of years. 20 years was when I started utilizing it. One of the fastest way to get those documents that we need, that we need the, to be able to put it away in actual recognizable character form, we think it's about typing the whole thing. If a person has, right now, a cell phone that has any kind of texting ability on it, you can just have the person speak into it and send it by text message to um, a to an email address or whatever to be able to get that down without any kind of text typing being needed. A lot of the times the people that actually volunteer to help me, they say, Lila, I can't type. And I say, that's okay. Do you know how to say the word period? If you can pause and say the word period where the periods go and say the word question mark and wait for it to give you a question mark, you can use my phone to be able to convert everything that I have. And I have never, I haven't had anybody I've had to turn away for not being able to type. And those little 85-year-old ladies, they like to hear that. Thanks. That's a good idea. Right? That's something to try for oral histories, too. Yeah. Uh, because, the, you know, oral, oral histories are great to listen to, but they're not searchable. And as speech recognition gets better and better, we're going to be able to transcribe those automatically. Otherwise, somebody's got to sit down and listen to it and type it out, and that's just not going to be practical. Gene Akron, archivist, uh, assistant archivist again. Uh, on my scanner problem, is there software other software I could possibly download to my machine to try and read from this obsolete scanner? Mm, did you search on the internet to see? That's all I could suggest is uh, do a web search. Um, I, I believe our IT people did hmm. search. So, and, uh, I had um, I got a graphic artist volunteer who was trying to update our displays, and we copied in 600 DPI, and it took the scan and come up on the computer, but then when we pulled it back up on the computer and only scanned it at 96 DPI. I, we don't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, 96 uh, isn't. Away and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, did you? I know what GSO Archives does with oral histories is they do indexing rather than transcripts in, in a lot of cases. They have transcribed some things, uh, but they do indexing. I've asked them for some examples, uh, but I haven't convinced them yet to provide these things. Uh, but if other people are interested in how to do indexing, basically you write down about where in the talk somebody said something concerning a group or a person or something like that, something notable in the talk. And it's that I can do. Um, transcribing, I just don't type fast enough. That's a good point. And, and one of the metadata fields that I didn't talk about is keywords. Uh, when we were scanning the minutes for Area 32, 
we got stuff that was not OCRable. Uh, it was not going to be searchable. So I had my committee, and it's always good to give the committee easy things to do that, where they're feeling active. And I gave them all highlighters and passed around copies of, of the minutes and asked them just highlight anything that was an important term. What did we do at that, uh, at that area assembly? What kind of decisions were taken? And so they go through and highlight, and then I just take those words and put them into a keyword uh, field in the metadata. So now the, at least the keywords are searchable. We can find where, where the area decided how to reimburse delegates for travel expenses or you know, whatever the topic was. One of the problems that we noticed with uh, sheet feed uh, multiple document scanners is you, got, you have to be careful of heel-toe documents. For instance, if you have a document that's that reads this way and you turn it over and it's upside down, that's 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 what you're going to get some upside down pages. So you kind of got to watch that. Yeah, good point. And in in a PDF editor program, uh, a lot of them will allow you to flip that. Um, what you got to watch out for too is staples. If you if you don't get all of the staples <laughs> before you run it through the sheet feeder. My name is Lee, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm from California, Northern Interior Area 07. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, experience in the room of uh, translating uh, archive documents um, into the obvious languages, French and, and Spanish. Yeah, great question. Um, in Area 58 right now, we're not translating archive documents, but we're translating currently generated minutes and, and other uh, area assembly records, uh, run them through Google Translate, and they do a pretty good job. We have a translation committee uh, of people that do translations, but they've asked us to run it through Google Docs first, and then they clean it up. And they they tell me that the Google Documents or Google Translate rather does a, a pretty good job of it. So Google Translate is only as good as the people who go after and fix it, because by itself uh, it is an insult, quite frankly. Yep. I do apologize. We are out of time. Uh, I would like to thank. Everyone for uh, who participated.